Six months into the Ukraine conflict, what impact have Western sanctions had on Russia's economy? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. When Russia launched its special military operation in Ukraine last February, the United States and other Western countries responded by imposing wide-ranging sanctions on Moscow. The objective was to cripple Russia's economy. But six months later, after an initial nosedive, the ruble has rebounded to become a top performer in the global currency market. And Russia continues to earn billions of dollars each month from exports of its oil and gas. While Western economists say the sanctions will degrade Russia over the long term, the Kremlin argues that the country's economy has not only withstood the pressure, but it's the West now experiencing economic hardship. Well, there is much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Graham Allison served as a U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense in the first Clinton administration. He's currently a professor of government at Harvard University's Kennedy School. Alex Vatanka is the director of the Middle East Institute's Iran program and a senior fellow with the Frontier Europe Initiative. Also with us is Anton Fedyoshin. He's a Russian affairs analyst and history professor at American University. And Alexander Gonov is a political science professor at the Moscow Institute of International Relations. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Alexander Gonov, let me start with you. These, of course, are crushing sanctions that have been imposed on Russia. The intention, as I said, was to wreck the Russian economy, to degrade its leadership, leadership to weaken its military. But to quote The Economist, uh, very much an establishment newspaper and uh, a publication that supports sanctions, it said, so far, the sanctions war is not going as well as expected. What's the view in Moscow? How concerned are Russian leaders over these sanctions? Well, uh, I'm not in a position to speak, <laughs> speak on behalf of the Russian leaders, uh, but uh, judging from uh, what they say and how they look like, they don't seem to be very con much concerned, really. Uh, I would say that most of the, uh, of the Russian uh, society, I mean, I mean, I mean the, the analysts, the, the, uh, the political commentators, the, the economic experts, they are concerned about the situation in Europe. Because, because in Europe and also in the United States, but mostly, but mostly in the European Union, because uh, Russia uh, is not interested in the collapse of European economy, uh, and uh, even even the the recession that has started in the states and in Europe is not in the in the interest of Russia, because Russia has been a, a long-term economic partner. With, uh, with the European countries, especially such countries as Germany, France, some other countries. So, so this is what we are concerned about. As to the Russian economy, it, uh, it did really suffer a blow uh, when, uh, when uh, the sanctions were first imposed. But since then, uh, during the last uh, six months, uh, it has, it has uh, become better and better. The economy is adapting to the situation and uh, and even growing in some in some uh, areas so uh, things don't seem to be uh, to be uh, very dull and if you ask me about uh, the impression of me as a as a head of a household well i don't see i don't see any great uh, differences graham allison uh, if the intention of sanctions was to force russia to withdraw from ukraine to degrade its military to weaken its uh, relation its uh, leadership um is it fair to say right now that so far it's not worked well uh, i think it's mix, mixed picture you have to start with the big picture so russia had been growing at roughly two percent uh, a year for the last several years it's going to grow this year uh, current best estimates from imf about minus six percent so it's taking an eight percent hit in terms of its overall GDP of what it would have been absent Putin's war. So I think the West has been determined, and I believe will succeed in making it clear that this was a grave strategic blunder in Putin's invasion of uh, Ukraine. That's point one. Point two, though, 
the hope that the sanctions or the exaggerations about the sanctions having a crippling effect in the short run have been exaggerated. And I think the uh, economist line that you uh, uh, led with and the story is a sound story. That if you look at the key indicators after the initial uh, uh, shock, uh, which was significant, the ruble has actually strengthened mm -hmm. uh, after the initial shock in which people were expecting, say, the IMF or Goldman or J.P. Morgan were expecting an 8 percent decline. Now they're talking about 6 percent, some even maybe 5 percent decline. Mm -hmm. So it's improved. If you look at the hope that this would isolate the Russian economy from the world, mm -hmm. actually the, its exports uh, to Europe and the U.S. have declined dramatically, mm -hmm. but been more than made up for by imports from China and India, Turkey. Mm -hmm. So I would say in the short run or to intermediate run, the hope that by strengthening Russia's economy right. would strangle Putin's ability to pursue the war uh, was misguided and is not succeeding mm -hmm. in the short run. Right. Graham, if, as you say, the West is determined that these sanctions will ultimately succeed, let's say the Russian economy is severely damaged, its leadership is weakened, its military is degraded, then what? Well, I think uh, that's a great question. <laughs> and, uh, uh, that's a whole other lecture and discussion, and nobody knows, obviously. But I'd say, unfortunately, uh, Putin, in his aggression against Ukraine, and also in his conception of what this is all about, has basically set himself on a course that is so antithetical to the interests and values and views in the U.S. and Europe that the relationship between the U.S. and Russia will be spoiled for certainly all of his period as a ruler of Russia, which I think will continue for some period of time to come. So I think if you want a first approximation, again, historical analogs are not perfect, but if you want a first approximation, think about Cold War II. Anton Fedyashin, are you surprised at the resilience of the Russian economy? Does it tell us, actually, that Russia had anticipated this response, that it planned for it, that it was way ahead of what the West was doing? Anand, it was in uh, some ways. It wasn't in uh, others. I don't think the Russians uh, expected the severity, especially of the Europeans joining in in the sanctions. But listen, this point is now moot in a sense. We've been discussing these questions for a few months now. Um, now the issue, for me at least, is less whether the Russians had prepared what they foresaw, but the question now is how did the Europeans make such a uh, mistake in underesting, underestimating the boomerang effect of the sanctions on their own economies. Um, the Russian economy has certainly been impacted very severely, and I agree with uh, Professor Allison, who just mentioned the 10% uh, uh, decline in growth figure. On the other hand, the amount of money that the Russians are bringing in, which is uh, even The Economist and The Wall Street Journal just published an article about the amount of money that energy exports are bringing in, these kinds of windfalls the Russians couldn't have dreamed of uh, in any other circumstance. And meanwhile, Europe is about to enter a very, very serious uh, economic crisis going into the fall and the winter. So the Russians, for now, seem to be in a position where you can't say that they have economically won, but the Europeans have lost equally. If not more, we'll have to see how things unfold going into the winter. So if I were Putin, I wouldn't be terribly worried about the to midterm economic ramifications of the sanctions because they've actually leveled the playing field. What about the long term? The long term, no one can predict. I'm not an economist. If economists could predict the long term, they'd be billionaires with uh, private islands of their own. Um, listen, uh, I don't know what the long term is going to be, but I will say this. If the Russians had had no alternative to Europe and the greater West, they would be in a very problematic situation. But they do have an alternative. They have the global South. 
something that Vladimir Putin has been trying to tap into economically and financially for almost two decades now, something he was chronically unable to do, in large part because of Russian business interests. It was cheaper and easier to borrow from the West, to, to export and import from the West. All of a sudden now, the Russians are turning towards the Greater Eurasia Project, and they are finding willing partners in this. And if they were turning towards a region of the world which is chronically poor and nosediving economically, I could understand that this would be a dead end. Mm -hmm. But uh, Asia is not uh, nosediving. As a matter of fact, demographically and economically, it is expanding and probably right. will be for the rest of the century. The Russians look like they've made a gamble. We'll yeah. see if it pays off. Alex Vatanka, uh, if... Russia needs to learn any lessons on the impact of sanctions, then it need look no further than Iran. And you'll be familiar with this, of course. You're the director of the Middle East Institute's Iran program. Let's look at the situation as far as sanctions is concerned in Iran. More than 650 individuals and companies in that country were sanctioned by former President uh, Barack Obama. Uh, the pressure increased under President Trump. Uh, after he withdrew from the uh, nuclear deal. Iran was cut off from the international payment system known as uh, SWIFT. But Iran is still there. Its leadership is still intact. What does that tell us? Well, I mean, that's a great question. I, I would say this, you know, to follow up on what we've had in the conversation so forth, there is the issue of the short term and then there's the issue of the long term. I mean, when the United States first started imposing severe sanctions on Iran back in the uh, Obama administration, when the president in Iran was a ma man by the name of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and the price of oil was around $120 a barrel, Iran was fine. The sanctions didn't matter. But you know what was happening at the same time? The Iranian public was losing confidence in their own market. That's when you started seeing capital flight. That's when you started seeing brain drain. That's when you started seeing the Iranians not investing in long-term economic pre projects in their own country, never mind the foreign investors. So. There is a direct cost in terms of how much Russia is losing in terms of oil and gas and other export income. This is exactly what Iran has experienced. And then there's the indirect cost of sanctions, which is very hard to measure. But in a decade into it, if you look at the Iranian economy, and it's wrong just to look at GDP figures. If you want to get a sense of the health of a nation, you got to look broadly, broadly than that. I mean, give you one indicator. Iran, Iran right now, today, is losing its elite, its professional class. They're leaving the country. These are the sorts of things that are difficult to measure. It's a result of sanctions and overall isolation. And I suspect the Russians will experience something similar going forward. And again, you won't see the results anytime soon, but that's the sort of thing to watch out for. But Alex, the other thing is that if the intention of those sanctions on Iran was to get Iran to abide by the West's rules and what the West wants in Iran, then it's failed, hasn't it? Well, yes and no. I mean, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen with the outcome of the nuclear talks. It looks like a deal is going to happen. But you're right in the sense that what the maximum pressure campaign of the Trump administration was all about certainly didn't happen. So, yes, there will have to be some compromise. I am no expert on Russia. I suspect what you need to do is, you know, if there's a political solution to the crisis in Ukraine, who would pull away from which territories in return for what? I mean, that's basically what's happened between the Iranians and the Americans on the nuclear issue. Um, but no, I would also say sanctions clearly focus yeah. minds in Iran. Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the Iranian supreme leader, would not be sitting down and talking to the Americans if he didn't have to. He right. has to. Because he wants the American empire, as he calls it, to be a declining one. Yeah. And he might be a declining one. Who knows? But it's not happening overnight. And he discovered that the hard way. Alexander Gunov, I want to get back to something that Anton Fedyashin was talking about, and that's the future direction uh, of Russia's foreign policy, indeed the future direction that Russia will take. I mean, do you believe that Russia has abandoned its efforts to improve its relations with the West, especially with uh, Western Europe, is now looking to the East to find new markets and to grow new relationships? Well, Russia has not abandoned uh, its uh, intention, its readiness to cooperate with European countries and even with the United States. So as soon as they are ready, uh, Moscow will be ready and they can put that in the bank. Uh, and uh, Russia has more than once proved that it's ready to cooperate. It, uh, Russia has proved it, well, uh, uh, even during the Cold War. During the Cold War, we had the Soyuz Apollo project to launch missiles, uh, rockets together to outer space, and are now signed to, and our cosmonauts and astronauts went, went flying uh, 
uh, in outer space. So, so, so uh, Russia is ready, but uh, for the time being, Russia is really turning uh, turning to other parts uh, of the world, and it's not only East. It's not as as simple as that. Though it looks very simple. Look, uh, Russia is no longer uh, it, it has reduced dramatically the sales of Russian oil to Europe because Europe doesn't want Russian oil. So what's happening? Russia is selling its oil to India in an increasing in increasing amounts, and uh, for for uh, it's selling it for. For more money than it used to be selling it. Now, India then is reselling the Russian oil to Great Britain, adding a new value to to the same Russian oil. Finally, Russian oil comes to Great to to, to, to Great Britain. But who is uh, who uh, who is profiting? Russia is profiting. India is profiting, but not the uh, the 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 Britain and, and and the British people. So so this is only one example of Europe shooting itself into its own in, in, into its own foot. Russia is not only looking at China uh, as a partner, as many people are, uh, are uh, uh, saying it's happening today. We're looking at Africa, at the Arab world, at the, at Latin America, which is a very perspective market. Also, the Southeast Asia, uh, Singapore, Singapore, the relations with Singapore are growing dramatically today. Graham Allison, what do you make of what Alexander Gwenov just told us, that what these sanctions have done, maybe unintentionally, is that it's forcing new alignments, new relationships in the world. I mean, as Alexander just told us, for instance, Russia is now selling its oil to India. Uh, India is reselling that oil to Britain, for instance. The benefactor in all of this is Russia. Well, I mean, the, the uh, paradox of sanctions is that if you do not have a monopoly in the, of the item that you're sanctioning, what you do by uh, sanctioning a party is shift their uh, source of supply or demand. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's having the effect of shifting the supply of Russian oil to China, which is buying increasing amounts. Actually, now Chinese imports from uh, Russia are back to uh, above where they were uh, in 20, in, in same month, month to month in, in 2021. Uh, India, big increases. Turkey, big increases. So that's a predictable effect of squeezing the balloon and seeing where it pops up. I think in terms of the relationship between especially China and Russia, that's become the thickest relationship, maybe the thickest relationship between two non-announced allies in the world. So that's to watch. And I think the Global South proposition that one of my colleagues made earlier is something that mm -hmm. Russia's been interested in for some time. And if you watch and see what happens at the Shanghai Cooperation Meeting here just in a month, right. you'll see leaders from uh, not, a, not just China and India, but from Turkey, from Pakistan, uh, uh, from, you know, so I would say that this project is going forward, and it's no longer the case that the West has a monopoly of all things economic and technological. Yeah. So the attempt to cut off Russia from the West will not succeed in cutting it off from the world. Anton Fridiashin, on that point of the West not having the monopoly on all things ecological um, or in terms of resources, uh, I mean, one thing this conflict has shown us and the consequent sanctions that have been imposed on Russia is that Russia is not just an exporter of energy. I mean, if we look, it's also the world's largest exporter of wheat, a major source of fertilizer, semi-finished iron, nickel, and it has the fourth largest reserves of rare earth uh, metals. What kind of leverage does that give Russia? It gives it enormous amounts of leverage in terms of uh, being in control of materials that uh, everyone essentially uh, needs. Uh, people very often make the mistake of assuming that going into the age of technology makes you less reliant on the earth, on uh, soil on uh, hard matter, nothing could be further from the truth. It makes you more reliant 
on uh, certain metals that are rarer and therefore more expensive. That, that is number one. But second, Anand, there is, however, despite the silver lining for Russia, also uh, an embedded risk here. All of the things that you very correctly mentioned that Russia has an advantage over um, uh, many other countries in, they are still all commodities. What we haven't mentioned are chips, are, you know, uh, automobiles that are sold all over the world, although Russian automobiles are sold in many countries. What the Russians need to do is really to modernize their economy and start moving it uh, away from oil, gas, and metals, and rare earth uh, stuff. Um, this is going to be a tall order. Mm -hmm. However, if the Russians play their cards intelligently, the human history is at a point where the West no longer has a monopoly on industrial goods and on the IT sector. So we'll see how these uh, things uh, evolve over the next few months. Uh, but things are certainly not nearly as dire for the Russian uh, economy mm -hmm. as I the initial Western expectations um, planned that they would become. Alex Vatanka, uh, talking about these new realignments that we are seeing uh, globally, uh, Graham Allison was talking a moment ago about the improving relationship between Russia and China. There's also been something of a rapprochement between Russia and Iran. President Putin actually was in Iran uh, in July, that was only uh, a month ago, and Russia has promised major investments in Iran as well. What's behind this? Where do you see it going? Now, speaking of the sort of big strategic alignment, look, the reality is Russia and China and Iran and a number of other countries out there uh, under uh, you know, places like Venezuela and so on have for a long time wanted to get together when it was convenient, when it was a win-win situation and sort of push back against the liberal democracies of the world, the United States, Western Europe. That is nothing new. You've seen that, you know, play itself out in places like the United Nations Security Council, where, for example, Russia and China, China have in recent years come to Iran's aid. But that's different than saying that overnight that you can turn that anti-Western sort of sentiment into something very uh, tangible as far as economic cooperation is, is concerned. Iran and uh, Russia happen to be two uh, rivals for oil and gas markets. We were talking about India before. Guess who's losing the market share in India? It's Iran. It's the country of Iraq, whose uh, oil uh, export to India last quarter went down by 9%. So the Russians are taking somebody else's market share. And that means the global south, yes, there will many countries in the global south will welcome Russia with open arms if they're giving, giving discounts. And that's what the Russians are doing right now. The, re the reason why Russia is getting oil market share in places like India is because of the discounts they're providing. But I'm just suggesting to you, it's not going to be that straightforward. It's not going to happen overnight. And final point I make is, it's not the, like the West has no options to counter. There's a lot the West can do, the United States can do. And so Russia has to prepare itself that if this conflict over Ukraine becomes a protracted one to last over years, I suspect Washington and European nations will come up with counter plans to, you know, make sure that whatever it is they're trying to make out of these sanctions to, to make Russia change course, that will be more effective going forward. Right. And Alex, why haven't they done that already? Uh, I think it's early days. I think clearly what you see in Europe right now over the energy crisis, again, I'm no expert on European politics, yeah. but it's very obvious for even a casual observer. The agreement, the consensus that was there initially started sort of weakening a bit, but that doesn't mean that's the only way forward. Europe can come together again if they believe in their values and right. standing up for what, you know, they, they can come up with, with another round of ways of, of pressuring Russia. OK. Alexander Gornov, getting back to the situation in Iran, I mean, what do you make of this burgeoning relationship between Russia and Iran? Is it just a marriage of convenience? What is Moscow's goal? Well, uh, first of all, uh, the, uh, this, uh, this romance, <laughs> let's uh, call it, of, of Moscow with Tehran is no one. It's been going on, it's going to be been going on for decades now. Well, uh, Russia, of course, uh, I should say that Moscow doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't have the ability to invest as much money and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, stuff like that into the region. But it's winning today by smart uh, uh, political and diplomatic diplomatic moves. Mm -hmm. It's much, it, it, it has proved to be much smarter than Western diplomacy in the region, in the region because uh, Russia has more people, more specialists that understand the region better than 
uh, than the uh, Western Western right. scope. Well, what's going on with, uh, with Iran? Well, you talk about sanctions that were imposed on Iran, but today uh, reports say that Russia uh, the, 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 that Russia will be getting about 1,000 Iranian drones. So mm -hmm. Iran has developed one of the best drones in the world, right. being under sanctions, and it's uh, and it's delivering delivering them to Russia yeah. in response. They, they want Russian uh, planes, helicopters, tanks, missile systems, and so on and so forth. Graham Allison, I've just got a little bit of time left, and I want to address this issue. You know, when, when sanctions were imposed against Russia, and the United States announced those sanctions very quickly, uh, it played well in the United States media. But something that we don't hear about very often is the fact that the United States continues to trade with Russia. Uh, I was looking at some figures. There has been a drop in the imports from Russia, but since sanctions were imposed, there have been something like 3,600 shipments arriving at U.S. ports from Russia. Um, so, I mean, what do you make of this? How can you have sanctions and at the same time violate them? Well, I think, again, unfortunately, it's uh, Sanctions 101 that basically uh, sanctions start with grand announcements uh, in which the bark is a lot bigger than the bite. Uh, there's always the period of adjustment for the sanctions to kick in. There's always adjustments. There's always loopholes. There's always cutouts. And so basically, the first line that you hear from the pol politicians are the headlines, but you've got to look under the, you know, under the, to the details. So, for example, Europe is cutting off its purchase of uh, Russian oil by when? 2027. So there's a, and I would say you're seeing the same thing in the American markets. Yep. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.